Thank you, Claudia, for that nice introduction. Thank you for the invitation to be here with you. That's a uh, wonderful session. I really enjoyed Eric's talk. It's a, he's a tough act to follow. Um, I'm going to talk, as you heard, a little bit about uh, rigor. Let's see if I can get this right. There we go. Rigor in nutrition and obesity research. This is a very big, hot topic today. And one of the many questions we often, I often get from people who are not so enmeshed in it is, is this really a big problem? Isn't this a problem only for psychology? Isn't it just that we need to um, uh, just have another little quick conversation about it? We don't need to really invest in it, and I hope to convince you otherwise. I'm not going to read all of my disclosures and all for you. They're here. More importantly, there's my email address. Feel free to drop me uh, an email, and I'll be glad to send you the slides. So one of the things I want to start off by talking about making mistakes, and that's basically what this talk is going to be about. And I'm going to make some fun of some mistakes that have occurred in the literature. But I want to point out that I'm not just making fun of other people's mistakes, that we're all human, and we all make mistakes. And I make mistakes. And this is from a paper uh, that it talked about a mistake I made. So some years ago, and I, Scott Keith, who was one of my students at the time, we published a paper. And we showed that um, corrections for self-report bias in BMI and mortality studies didn't necessarily make the results better. And we had used some equations from some other authors listed here. And after our paper came out, I got an email from one of these authors. And they said, we're using the public raw data that you used, the NHANES data, and we can't reproduce your results. Uh-oh. So this is the email you never want to get. So they said, all right, well, we'll take it seriously. So we sent them our code, and we said, send us your code. And we compared our codes. And we were able, because the data were publicly available, to know we were running the same data. And eventually what we figured out is that there was a mistake in their paper such that they hadn't reported their coefficients clearly and accurately. And then my student, in trying to make sense of it, had leapt to a, an inference about what the co coefficients should have been. And he did that incorrectly. And so each of the groups had made a mistake. And so we acknowledged our mistakes. We said, well, let's just get together. And we were well, one paper in which the group of us together corrected all the mistakes in the two papers and published it. And I think it's important to point this out because I point out that, first of all, everybody makes mistakes, that the availability of public raw data and then the willingness and ability to share code led to the quick and easy detection of the mistake, and that it was a painless correction. It wasn't fun. It was slightly embarrassing, but it was no big deal. There were no recriminations. We had found a mistake. We fixed it. All right. I also want to point out about the idea that these concerns are not new. We often hear the narrative of a crisis. Is there a reproducibility crisis? Is there a replication crisis in science in general, in psychology in particular, in nutrition in particular? And it all depends, I think, on what you mean by a crisis. I think we can mean at least three different things by a crisis. One, we can talk about an imminent system failure. We've got a system that's been working up to date system is science as a way of knowing, and it's about to fail. I don't think there's any evidence whatsoever that we're facing imminent system failure. The second idea of crisis is that things are changing. Things are getting worse. And there, I just don't think we have a lot of really great evidence one way or another. I don't think we've got careful studies over many years that tell us whether science is more or less rigorous today than it was in the past. I'll show you some aspects of that. I think there's a third aspect of crisis, though, that I think we are definitely in. And that is the idea when you simply say, as a society, you know what? The current system is not good enough. We no longer accept it as a, as a sufficiently robust system for dealing with what we want to deal with. And I think that is where we are with rigor in science. I think people have said, as a community, you know what? There are problems in the rigor in science. It's no longer acceptable. The standard things we've put into place of just an honor system, peer review, and so on, they're insufficient. We need something else in addition. And um, 
we'll get to some of that. But I want to talk about this idea of change and point out that I don't think there's a crisis in terms of things being radically different than they are. So today, for example, you probably all heard about the PREDI-MED study being retracted last week. Probably the, one of the largest, most expensive, most important, influential, randomized controlled trials in the field of nutrition. One of the first ones that showed in sort of normal, not people with a severe disease, that a diet could make a difference in a hard endpoint, right? It wasn't just lowering your cholesterol or your blood pressure. This was showing fewer deaths. And that paper has now fallen. It has fallen because John Carlisle showed that the randomization was suspect, and then upon further examination of it, and we'll get to it in more detail, it was found not to be legitimately randomized. So now it was retracted and republished as a non-randomized controlled trial. But in fact, how different is this than the Lanarkshire milk experiment in which 20,000 children were assigned to either have no free milk, raw milk, or pasteurized milk in 1930, and then the great student, as in student's t-test, wrote a paper about it in Biometrica in 1931 and talked about the debacle of that study and how a lack of proper randomization led to an inability to draw strong inferences. Same thing 80 years later, nearly 90. We heard again in the last couple of weeks that the NIH yanked an ongoing trial that was going to be the definitive trial, hopefully, to really tell us whether moderate alcohol consumption in fact was beneficial. Many people believe it is, based largely on observational epidemiology. We know that the observational epidemiology does not unequivocally tell us cause and effect. And so we're going to do a rigorous randomized controlled trial. Well, some irregularities and procedures occurred. Uh, I'm not sure that I actually see the science as as bad as some other people saw it as, but politically it became hot. Um, this has now been, this trial has been stopped, and it's sort of the, the narrative in the public sphere is uh, NIH scientists were bad, they were in collusion with the alcohol industry, and this was yanked. How different is this? Then another sign here, this is written up in science. This was also written up in science about 30 years ago. The USDA admits a mistake in doctoring a study about the effects of nutrition programs in WIC. So again, these are not new that perhaps the government has, uh, in some people's eyes, inappropriately manipulated some of the information around nutrition science. Let's keep going. And here we see that in 2018, Catherine Flegel and colleagues talked about challenges in the use of self-report, in this case self-reported heights and weights, and how they can bias the results of BMI and mortality or obesity and mortality papers. How different is that from 1945 when McHenry et al. talk about the problems of self-report in nutrition science? And here we have just about um, I think less than a year ago, a paper retracted on the gut microbiome, and this was pointing out that there were some problems in the studies. Uh, this was a study pointing out that uh, changes in the gut microbiome could have great impact on health, published by a, an author of a book that was really pushing this kind of gut microbiome-based diet. Uh, the study turned out to be a very flawed study. It was retracted. Um, but how different is this than the concerns raised in science in 1916 about common but incorrect statements whoops, concerning the number of bacteria in milk and the uh, problems in measuring uh, bacteria? So these are not new problems to the fields of science in general, and they're certainly not new problems to the fields of nutrition. I think it's just important to point that out. It's not new, but it's time to make them better. All right, so why focus on errors? Well, I think I've already given you some idea. And how did we stumble on this? Well, as many of you know, my group puts out this obesity and energetics offerings every Friday. If you've not signed up for it and you want to, you can just go to this website and sign up for free. And every Friday, you'll get this list of papers. And in putting that list together, my colleagues and I 
look at the titles of literally hundreds of papers every week. We read the abstracts of a smaller subset of that and read the full papers of an even smaller subset. And what's common is as I'm sort of doing this every week, I sort of read papers and I ask myself often, gee, this seems funny, could that be true? And then I look a little further and I say, I don't know about this. And I'll often pick up the paper or the abstract and email it to a handful of close colleagues and say, does this make any sense? And what often comes back is, no, this doesn't make any sense. No, this couldn't be true. It's not possible. The math is wrong. Um, it doesn't check with the clinical trials registration. The statistics are wrong. The physics is wrong, and so on. And we started seeing things that were so wrong that we started to write letters. We weren't just talking about a difference of opinion and in interpreting something. We're talking about doing the math wrong. And papers, some papers started to get retracted. But it was also interesting how much authors and journals resisted admitting a mistake that was clearly an obvious mistake. And Nature actually got wind of what we were doing and contacted us and said, would you write a paper on this for us? So we did. There's our paper published in Nature a couple of years ago in which we talked about not only the frequency of these very severe mistakes, but in fact the difficulty in getting fellow scientists and particularly journals to acknowledge that a true invalidating error had occurred. And by invalidating error, I mean an error of sufficient magnitude that it overturns the conclusions of the study and be willing to correct it. All right, so let me give you some case studies about this. So this was one that illustrates one of the points. This came up in a journal, probably most of you don't read all the time, the Journal of Paramedical Sciences. Somebody else pointed me, might be, you know, the Journal of Paranormal Sciences, perhaps. Um, <laughs> And what we found was this paper, it was a randomized controlled trial of a food service system that seemed to have positive benefits in reducing staff's BMI in an, a randomized controlled trial. And we looked at the distribution at baseline of BMI or body weight. And what we found was that the distribution of body weight was significantly different between groups and was reported as P equals zero, zero. Now, by chance alone, when you randomize, sometimes the groups will be different at baseline, right? 5% of the time, you should get a P value less than 0.05 for a baseline difference. 1% of the time, you should get it less than 0.01, and so on. That happens, no big deal. Doesn't mean your randomization failed, doesn't mean your study's biased, happens. But when you see a p-value small enough, you say, gee, this is kind of a little interesting. When we took the data and calculated the p-value ourselves, we got 10 to the minus 17, roughly. <laughs> All right, now, let me just make this clear. If every one of the seven billion people on the planet did their own randomized controlled trial, and in each of those randomized controlled trials, they tested a thousand different variables for baseline differences, and we used a Bonferroni correction to correct for the fact that there were seven billion times a thousand different tests done, 10 to the minus 17 would still be statistically significant. So for practical purposes, this is impossible. So we wrote a letter to this effect. The authors could not produce the data, and therefore the journal retracted the paper. So this was one where we thought, okay, this was a good outcome. It took a little while. Again, the authors weren't going to do it, but the editor stepped in and did the right thing. Here's the PREDIMED. We're still on randomization here. You see a lot of concern, a lot of problems with randomization. I'm only giving you a few of the many examples we've stumbled across. Um, PREDIMED was withdrawn because one of the sites, at least, didn't do the randomization properly. They, for example, would take an entire clinic and assign that clinic to either be all treatment or all control. Or they would take husbands and wives in a family and say, well, if we're gonna assign one to treatment, then we have to assign them both to treatment because they live and eat together. Well, that's not purely random and you have to take that into account in the analysis. You've now done a cluster randomized trial, right? And they didn't realize that. What does this reflect? It reflects, first of all, that most people don't understand how randomization really works and how to do it properly. And that's okay, but you need to monitor that. So it suggests a failure in the implementation and monitoring. Where were the study monitors? Where were the statisticians on this 
doing the proper monitoring. We see this a lot in clinical trials when they're being run by non-statisticians. We see it in animal studies all the time. I say to our investigators, our colleagues, when you gave the animals diet A or diet B, how did you house the animals? And they say, well, there were five mice per cage. I say, well, in a cage, did they all eat the same thing? Yeah. So you did, were they first in the cage, and then you assigned the cage to the diet? Yeah. I say, so how did you take the cage effect into account in the analysis? They say, cage effect? And I'm talking National Academy of Science players. It's just not in their vocabulary, right? We talk about the jargon from earlier. So we need to up our game in terms of helping people understand about randomization. Now we have, unfortunately, again, probably what was the most important randomized controlled trial in nutrition, or at least the most compelling and interesting, now is no longer really considered a pure randomized controlled trial. Misleading visual representations happen a lot. This is from an old book by Daryl Huff, published in the 1950s, called How to Lie with Statistics. It's a fun book. You can read it on a plane in about a half hour. It talks about different visual representations. Here, if you want to explain that, you know, under this policy, money is greater than under that policy, and you make this bag three times higher than that bag because it results in three times more money, you have to take into account. But that's a three-dimensional object. That really means that the volume of that bag is three cubed times greater. And you're perhaps being misleading by making the height three times greater. So with that in mind, you know, I saw this paper come out a few years ago when it was a randomized controlled trial of a drug for obesity. It's an injectable drug. And the investigators reported a 7.3% reduction in waist circumference with liraglutide. And they had this little cartoon. I'm not animating it here, but if you go on their website, it's animated. And it shows this sort of somewhat obese person. And they take this big syringe and they stick it in themselves and they push it. And then the person starts to shrink until they get down to this size. And I looked at it and I said, that looks like more than 7.3%. So I got my son to get his ruler from school and we measured it and it was 11.4%. Then we figured out how to do it with pixels to do it a little more accurately. So I wrote an email to the New England Journal of Medicine and I said, or a letter, and I said, you know, you guys have exaggerated the effect in this thing you've put out with the paper. And they wrote back and they said, Dr. Allison, you're absolutely right, we did and we're not going to publish your letter. And I think that's really interesting because it's not like they're running out of space to publish my letter. It's electronic. I mean, stick it on the website. What does it cost? Why not? This unwillingness to be strict about correcting the scientific record, unwillingness to admit mistakes. So we put it up ourselves in PubMed Commons. Uh, of course, then NIH has now taken down PubMed Commons, but somebody else imported it all into PubPeer, so you can still go look at our little letter if you want. Um, here's another one that came up. This one reflects, I think, the problem of lack of mathematical thinking. This paper came out on kids' meals. People had said, well, if you put out a policy that reduces the number of calories in kids' meals by this much, you'll get some weight loss. And they project, you know, the average kid eats this many fast food kids' meals uh, a week, and there's this many calorie differences, and they did a little math. And they came up with this, you know, a pound of body fat, 3,500 calories, therefore twice a week, 132 calories per week, blah, 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 two pounds less per year. I thought, oh, really, two pounds less per year? Maybe. Sounded a little ambitious. Could be plausible, perhaps. Then I read this one. Calculations in the model include children who are estimated to eat fast food four or more times per day. Like, really? 28 meals a week? Really? Um, I could maybe one week, but every week after week, a kid eats 28 meals or more per, day, uh, per week. Though rare, such children could theoretically expect to avert a weight gain of 27 pounds per year. I'm thinking, is the kid not even going to grow? You know, 27 pounds, does a kid grow 27 pounds in a year? You know, have you ever seen a kid? Have you ever been a kid? Are you kidding me? You know, what is this? <laughs> just seems implausible. So I went to my friend Kevin Hall, who has a mathematical model for this. We know this 3,500 calorie rule is bogus. We've published on it many times. And he used a proper mathematical model. And we showed that the estimates were off by an order of magnitude. Um, the further you went out of time, the more orders of magnitude they were off. 
We wrote a letter. The authors did the right thing. They retracted the paper. Regression to the mean is another problem we see a lot. This gentleman up here is Francis Galton, the cousin of Charles Darwin. And he was trying to, among other things, understand Darwin's theory. It wasn't clear why, at first, people thought there was sort of blending inheritance, right? You have a very tall father and a very short mother, or a very tall mother and a very short father. You'd get kind of like an average size kid, and people would blend. And if that was the case, wouldn't the variance get smaller? And then they realized, well, there must be new variants coming in at each point in time. So you inherit like the value of your parent plus some random error. Well, then shouldn't the error variance getting bigger every generation? But it doesn't, right? We don't, we're not all having 10-inch you know, people and 10-foot tall people. Why not? And so Galton's trying to figure this out. And he said, well, maybe what happens is you don't inherit the expected value of your parents plus some random error. You inherit the expected value of your parents shrunk toward the mean. Right? It took them a while to figure it out. We now would call it shrinking toward the mean or shrinkage or whatever, um, plus some random error. And then the variance stays constant. And that idea of, of being closer to the mean than your parent became the idea of reversion to mediocrity, reversion analysis, eventually called regression to mediocrity, and regression analysis. That's where we get regression from. So if you start with something very a person who's very high on a variable, right? If I measure your blood pressure today and it's very high and I measure it tomorrow, it'll probably be a little lower. If I measure your blood pressure today and it's very low and I measure it again tomorrow, it'll probably be just a little bit higher. And it's not just about measurement error and it's not just about time. If I measure your BMI and it's very high and I measure your spouse's BMI, it'll probably be a little bit lower on average than your BMI. And if your BMI is really low and I measure your spouse's BMI, probably be a little higher on average than your BMI. That's all called regression to the mean. So when you take your group of obese or overweight kids at baseline and you do some intervention and you don't have a control group and then you come in later and you say, you see, their BMI Z scores went down. Of course they went down. Galton could have told you this 100 years ago. Regression to the mean. And yet that's exactly what's done in many trials and we show that in many trials where they draw conclusions showing efficacy, we get exactly the same measures of efficacy, randomly picking kids who are fatter than average from databases and just following them over six to 12 months without any intervention. And that's why cats make bad scientists, because they eat the control groups. And if you don't have a control group, you can't have proper inference. There's another error we see a lot. We call it the DINS error. It stands for uh, difference in nominal significance. This is one we see a lot in exercise studies occasionally. We see it sometimes in animal studies. We see it a lot in dietary supplement studies. I don't know why in those areas that's where we happen to notice it. Um, these are a couple of examples here. Whoops. A couple of examples. And what is commonly done in this situation is you, you get a treatment group and you get a control group. The treatment group, let's say, loses a little weight. P equals 0.049. The control group doesn't lose a statistically significant amount of weight. P equals 0.051, perhaps. And you say, you see, treatment group lost weight. Control group didn't lose weight. Therefore, I have an effect. That is fallacious reasoning. What you need to do is compare the treatment group to the control group with a statistical test not compare each one to baseline. It has been shown many times. It's easy to show mathematically from first principles. You don't need to do a simulation. You don't need to do a meta-analysis. It's just straightforward math that this is nonsense. And anyone who's taken Statistics 101 should know it's nonsense, and yet we still see it done quite often. Um, and here are just a couple of examples where we've written about it. One of the most common things we see is problematic, particularly in the field of childhood obesity, is misanalysis and occasionally misdesign of cluster randomized trials. Cluster randomized trials, now think back to what I talked about, PREDIMED, assigning an entire clinic to treatment or assigning the husbands and wives together to treatment. You're assigning clusters of individuals, not individuals. All right. 
Now think about what happens with that. That kind of bugs people a little bit. If I say, well, suppose that I have two schools and I randomly assign one of the schools to treatment and one to control. And then I give all the kids in school A treatment and all the kids in school B are in control. And there's 200 kids in each school. You think we got 400 kids. Do a t-test at the end, n equals 400. You have 398 degrees of freedom, right? Now, suppose I did this. I want to look at the effects of a diet on a blood level. And, you know, research subjects are expensive. So I don't want to go and get 400 subjects. So I get two subjects. I assign one to the diet, one to control. And I get a big tube of blood, and I break it up into 400 little aliquots. And then, or 200 little aliquots per tube. And I do a separate test on each one. I say, N equals 400, 398 degrees of freedom, right? You're like, what are you, crazy? It's nonsense. That's exactly what you're doing when you take the 200 kids from the same school and you treat them as though they're all independent, right? They're like cells in the body. So we do cluster randomized trials all the time when we deal with biological organisms that have multiple cells. Each cell is like a little individual, but we don't analyze it that way. Nobody thinks about it. But somehow when it's kids in schools or patients in clinics, it boggles people's minds a little bit. So we wrote this paper in which we talked about how commonly these are misanalyzed. And I'll give you some examples here, or at least an example. This was from um, a paper recently we wrote about. And I think it points out two things. One is the persistent confusion or disregard for proper analysis in class to randomized trials. The other is the resistance to being willing to admit and correct a mistake. So a paper came out, I talked about this at dinner a little bit last night, with lots of fanfare. And this paper, with several press releases, an audio podcast in the journal, um, pointed out that gardening was effective in reducing obesity levels in children. And this is sort of one of those things where, you know, you just look at it and you, know, you start to think mathematically, which is, I think, real important, and you think, how much energy could a kid be spending in gardening? probably not enough to have a huge impact on weight, particularly then when you start to think about non-adherence, averaged over many kids, so on. doesn't seem that plausible. Well, maybe there's some other effect other than the energy expended in gardening. What would that effect be? What would the mechanism be? Going back to Eric's ideas, you know, is there a plausible mechanism? Wasn't that plausible to me? So I looked it up. First of all, it wasn't a gardening intervention, despite the fact that that was what was talked about. It was a multi-component intervention of which gardening was one piece. So you can't, even if it was effective, say it was gardening that had the effect, you could just say something had the effect. Looked further, was a cluster randomized trial. Two school districts, within each school district, two schools. One school assigned to treatment, one school assigned to control. The authors, in their methods paper published years earlier, pointed out that they were doing a cluster randomized trial and knew that the correct way to analyze this was to take the clustering into account, which they did in their analysis of all the districts combined on BMI, and they got no statistically significant result. They then said, well, we'll analyze it separately by district. Well, now you have only two schools. How many degrees of freedom left? Zero. No degrees of freedom. How do you even do a test? The right answer is you can't. The wrong answer is, forget that you did a cluster randomized trial, and analyze each kid as though they're a unique individual. That's what was done. We wrote a letter with several statisticians from several different universities, got together and said, this is just completely fallacious. These are incorrect analyses. There's no evidence whatsoever in this paper for an intervention effect, and you should correct or retract this paper. The authors wrote back and said, although we appreciate their, meaning our, expertise, we respectfully submit that they may not be fully familiar with the challenges of designing and implementing community nutrition education interventions in kindergarten through sixth grade, which I agree, I am not fully familiar with the challenges of that. And what in heaven's name has that got to do with the incorrectness of your statistical analysis? You know, there's this great saying by a, a songwriter named Eric Church, you know, growing, living in the South for several years now, I've come to really like that kind of music. And Eric Church and his country music has a song called, I learned that from a three-year-old. He says, when you're wrong, you should just say so. I learned that from a three-year-old. So we need to work on that a little bit in our field. <laughs>
And this was also illustrated here, where we pointed out a paper had published some methodologic guidelines on cluster randomized trial design analysis. The guidelines were patently incorrect. They were prov provably incorrect from mathematics. We wrote a letter to the editor, a commentary explaining it. The editor took our commentary, sent it to another statistician who said, yep, these statisticians are correct. The original paper is wrong. It should be retracted. They reached out to the authors who wrote the original paper. The original authors refused to retract the paper. And the editor published this whole story here, which then you can read about in Retraction Watch. So it points out the difficulty in getting people to be willing to correct even what is clearly an error. Uh, nevertheless, some people do it. This was a paper came out drawing conclusions that were incorrect based on uh, ignoring uh, regression to the mean. They had some kids in a treatment. Overall, there was no change in the kid's BMI. And then they did the thing that leads you right into regression to the mean. They said, let's look separately just at the overweight kids, and the overweight and obese kids. And they found among the overweight and obese kids, sure enough, BMI had come down. Well, of course it did. You pick kids who had high BMIs at the beginning. What did Galton say? They're going to come down, right? So we wrote a letter. And in fact, the authors just said, you know what? We made a mistake. We're wrong. We can't draw conclusions. And this was held up as a model of scientific integrity by Conscient Health in their blog. Meta-analyses are often things where we see errors. Here we often see the error in the effect size calculation. This is important because I think it gives us a lever into where we need to uh, focus on. Many people think that meta-analyses are really easy. Um, Ingram Olkin once said, doing a meta-analysis is easy. Doing it well is hard. And I think where people err is that they see the software out there and they say, all I've got to do is type in these numbers about effect sizes, means and standard deviations into the software. And then the software spits everything else back out to me. Well, it's true, but you have to type the right numbers in. And that's where people often get confused. And in my experience, it's the variance that gets them. They can get the means right, but they're not sure which variances to put in. And this leads to some strange things. And I'll give you an example here. This is from a book by Robert Abelson I quite like called Statistics as Principled Argument. And in it, he says, distributions of standardized effect sizes, sometimes called cones D, arising in meta-analysis show that in domains of substantive research of interest, it is unusual for this magnitude measure to be as big as one, meaning the treatment and control group, for example, to be one full standard deviation apart in their means quite rare for it to be as big as 1.4, and extraordinary for it to be as big as 2. So if you see an effect size as big as 2, you think, hmm, that's weird. Could be true, happens, but it's odd. All right? When you see a whole collection of effect sizes as big as 2, you go, wow, that's really odd. So this paper came out a few years back, Hypnosis as an Adjunct to Cognitive Behavioral Psychotherapy for Obesity, a meta-analytic. Well, our title was a meta-analytic appraisal. And the authors had shown an effect size, a mean difference, of 1.96, you know, almost exactly two. This was the average, but this is extraordinary. So I asked my postdoc at the time, Miles Faith, I said, Miles, can you go pull all those papers out? He did. We recalculated all the effect sizes, and we found many, many mistakes in the effect sizes, particularly around variance calculation. We corrected them, and then we found that the effect size was actually closer to about 0.2 to 0.3, not 1.6. So again, off by almost an order of magnitude, barely statistically significant, if statistically significant at all, and we corrected that in the literature. Here's another example. This is in glucomannan. Paper came out, showed glucomannan in a meta-analysis was effective for weight loss. I asked my postdoc to pull all the papers. We looked at them. We could recalculate everything except one. We wrote to the authors. They were impressed by the authors. Some authors in Poland, and they wrote back to us right away, and they said, uh, we'll be glad to cooperate with you and try to help figure this out. Um, we have the raw data from this one study where you can't replicate the results. I said, great, will you send us the raw data? They did. The raw data weren't really raw data. They were an Excel spreadsheet with means and standard deviations that they had gotten from the original authors of the paper. 
We looked at it. I couldn't make any sense out of their calculations. I kept trying it, even just to work my way through them. Couldn't do it. So I went to one of my, my uh, statisticians, Pong, and I said, Pong, can you get this? He said, oh, let me go work on it a while, come back. Comes back in about an hour, and he says, Dr. Allison, he says, you're gonna think I'm a little crazy, but take a look at this. I said, okay. And he says, you see the mean here, pre and post, and the mean change? I said, yeah. He says, mean change is me, mean post minus mean pre? I said, yeah. And he says, now look at the standard deviation pre and post. I said, yeah. He says, now look at the standard deviation of the change score. He says, if you ignore the signs, it's equal to standard deviation pre minus standard deviation post. I said, oh. So the investigators didn't know how to calculate and didn't understand that the standard deviation of a change is not the same as the difference in standard deviations. So they took the differences. In one case, they got a negative standard deviation. We're not dealing with imaginary numbers here, so you can't have a negative standard deviation. Remember, standard deviation is the square root of a squared thing. Can't be negative, so they just erased the sign and then they use that. <laughs> so this reflects, you know, some perhaps some confusion about variance. So we corrected it, it was no longer significant, and that was done. All right, insufficient checking, I think, is another problem that has. These are situations in which people scored things backwards, used the wrong data sets, got opposite conclusions, and I know some of these authors. Some of these are really bright people, and yet they did these. This is the equivalent of you know, a surgeon removing the wrong kidney. Um, here's another example of someone uploading the wrong data set in an exercise study and analyzing it and then having to retract the paper because they realize they've analyzed the wrong data set. And when you think of the analogy to a surgeon removing the wrong kidney, well, you think, well, what do surgeons do? Well, now they have checklists. You don't go into surgery without a checklist. And maybe we need some checklists. And so how do we create these checklists? This is something we're thinking about. There are idiopathic errors. This is just a fun one. We found in a randomized controlled trial in which massage therapy among people who are about 75 kilograms at baseline, adult Japanese persons, uh, lost close to 10% of their body weight in eight weeks from massage therapy. This is when you go, really? You know, I mean, it's hard to lose 10% of your body weight in eight weeks. And if we could all do it from massage, it'd be great. <laughs> so I looked at this and they reported the, the BMI and the, the body weight at baseline and at endpoint. And you know BMI is kilograms over meters squared. Now, the more mathematically inclined in the room are thinking, but the mean of the ratios is not the same as the ratio of the means, and that's true. But if you use geometric means, you can approximate it. We approximated the geometric means and we showed in order for these results to be true, just a little math, um, that these subjects who were normal adults would have had to grow in height six centimeters in eight weeks in order for these results to be true. So we wrote to the authors, they didn't respond to us, we then wrote to the editors, the editors then got the authors to respond, who then said, oh, there was a mistake, they fixed it, the results were only half as much weight loss, never heard but what was the nature of the mistake, but at least there's some fix there. And I think partly is we pick it up by being able to do a little simple math. All right. So these are some of the things I've gone through. I'm not gonna read them all again to you, but it points out that we don't just need to say generic things like people need to learn more statistics. What we see is that there are simple, there are specific things we can focus on to help make things better. This really makes me think also that we need to not think about just giving away statistics so much. You know, one of the things that I think many of you have um, heard about is many of the cases of retraction and correction going on in nutrition. And often what you see is that the standard for the field is I give my grad student the data and my grad student comes back with an analysis and I say, you took the one course in SPSS? And they say, yeah. I say, okay, good, good. We're good to go. That's my level of checking, right? So this is sort of a, a fun little story. A uh, neurosurgeon phones a statistical consultant, says, I'm doing a study. Can you just suggest a good statistics text? And the statistician says, I'm so glad you've called. I've always wanted to do brain surgery. Can you suggest a text on that? 
You know, now, I know I took shop in, in high school, and I learned how a combustion engine works, and I understand how a combustion engine works. It's not that complicated. I actually even took a little one apart in shop class 30 years ago and put it back together and so on. Do you want me to be the person who's checking your 747 before you fly home today? Probably not, even though I got the general idea of it. You probably would like to have a professional person doing this. Why do we deal with our statistics differently? And so just to wrap up, I think raw data sharing, as I've pointed out earlier, is a way that we can get things fixed and corrected better. This is an example in which we've gotten a paper on flaxseed retracted um, and corrected because the raw data were publicly available. Um, I think that we want to think about the whole workflow of data from designing the study all the way to interpreting the study, and then every step along the way, we can start to think about promoting a culture and identity of truth. Right? If you were to ask a lot of public health people and you'd say to them, what's the most important thing? You're a public health person. You're a professor of public health. What's really vital? It'd be interesting what people say. Some people would say, help people be healthier. Right? A public health professor, make people healthier. Make the public's health better. Beneficence, help people. Some other people would say, I'm a scholar, pursue the truth. That's the one thing that's uncompromisable. Well, those are two different things. Now, they're not necessarily incompatible, but there's sometimes some tension. What if you had a, a study that was aimed at preventing smoking in kids, and you thought it was a really good idea, and you wanted to get it out there, and you did a big, expensive trial, and guess what? P was 0.07. You, don't, you can't really say it's statistically significant. Would you bend it a little? Would you go back and p-hack? Would you keep analyzing until you got something better? Because you said, but this is important. We don't want people to abandon this trial, right? You heard Eric's discomfort with this idea of Fitbits don't work. He's saying, don't abandon it. Could be that they, some of these monitoring devices work under some circumstances for some people, which of course is true. They might. You see that tension about wanting, not wanting to say things are negative. But where's also the commitment to telling the truth? And I think we need to really promote this. You hear about Robert Wood Johnson, right? Culture of health. Where's the culture of truth? I think we in academia need to start using that phrase and talking about promoting a culture of truth. And here are the other things you need to do all along each step in the path. I think we need to be working on these things. So at this point, let me just wrap up and let's say let us take this path through the woods. These are some of our woods here in Indiana University in Bloomington. I hope some of you will come visit. Be delighted to take you for a uh, walk or a hike through the woods or our paths. Thank you. <laughs>